Well, let me, uh, yeah, I put on the web, uh, you know, linear programming used to be in the material for week zero because I used to teach it in 3, 1, 2, 1. Uh, but uh, I moved it now into the main sequence of lecture notes. Uh, and uh, I updated it with uh, a bit extra material that I covered uh, last time. And you have really very good uh, exposition of linear programming uh, with the more details in uh, this uh, algorithms textbook, uh, Corman, Lasserson, Rivas, and Stein, right? Uh, so, uh, so last time we saw how to use linear programming to solve uh, L1 and uniform norm minimization problems when you do uh, fit with uh, uh, a bunch of curves uh, as a linear combination of these curves to your uh, data and today we want to see how how in fact the max flow uh, mean cut theorem reduces to a uh, linear uh, a kind of more general fact about linear programs, right? So we have a So we have a uh, primal program P uh, that is uh, uh, maximized um, C of X, the objective that looks as follows. It's a sum J equals from one uh, to N. Cj xj, where Cj's are a uh, real constant uh, subject to the constraints um, sum j equals from one to N A I J uh, X J is smaller or equal than P J and plus extra condition that all the variables uh, up to X uh, N. So here J goes between one and N. So N is the number of inequalities. And additional assumption that uh, all the variables are allowed to take only positive values. And we saw last time how to um, get rid of this assumption by introducing for each variable two new variables uh, and replacing each variable with the difference of these two variables. Then you can assume that both variables are positive, but their difference, of course, can be of both uh, signs. So, so this is uh, uh, this can be uh, more written in a more compact way using matrix notation as uh, C of X is equal scalar product so C transpose times vector X Right, because this is just a scalar product of uh, the constant vector with coordinates cj and uh, uh, vector x with coordinates xj. And this one in our matrix notation is just that uh, uh, a uh, times uh, vector x is smaller or equal than vector b, uh, where um, where um, this inequality is a partial ordering only and it's to be interpreted every coordinate of the vector, resulting vector on the left is smaller or equal than the corresponding coordinate on the right, right? And of course we have also this inequality where zero is also just the vector of all zeros, right? 
So this is a compact way of writing this. And the dual program for this, the other by uh, P star, is uh, uh, the objective is uh, to be minimized Um, sum uh, when j goes, uh, uh, sorry, i goes from 1 to m, uh, and then you have pi i, uh, y, i. So this is now your objective z star of y, right? Uh, subject to the constraints um, sum uh, i equals from one to uh, uh, one to m uh, a i J um, times, 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 times. Uh, so here, yeah, it's J put, sorry. And then here we have Y, I uh, smaller or equal, oh, sorry, bigger than or equal than uh, C, um, J for J bigger or equal. Sorry, smaller, yeah, bigger or equal than one, smaller or equal than n, and of course all variables y1 up to uh, y uh, m have to be non-negative. And again, as in the primal, um, you you can write it in a compact form as a z star uh, uh, of y is equal to vector V transpose times Y, right, they are all vectors, and subject to the inequalities uh, uh, A transform, uh, sorry, A transposed uh, times uh, Y is bigger or equal than vector C, and of course vector Y with all coordinates uh, positive. So, as we noticed, uh, the coefficients of the objective of the primal program become lower bounds for the constraints inequalities of, of the primal, and uh, vice versa, the bounds, the upper bounds for the primal program become the coefficients uh, for the, the dual objective. Uh, and one can easily verify that if you now find the, the dual of this dual program, it brings you back precisely to the primal program. So uh, one can show that uh, uh, P star star will just collapse back uh, to P, right? Uh, now, how are feasible solutions to primal and dual program related? So, going to multimedia, right? Uh, we can now easily see the following fundamental relationship. Right? We have that, uh, let me keep exactly the same notation as in the notes. So we have that the objective z of x is equal 
to the sum, and then we have j equals from 1 to n, uh, cj xj, right? But now, using the uh, using these inequalities for the dual, we know right that each coefficient c j right is coefficient each coefficient c j is smaller or equal than the sum right so we can majorize the objective here using this inequality, so this will be smaller or equal than sum j is equal from 1 to n, and then instead of cj, right, instead of cj, we will majorize cj by uh, sum i equals 1 to m, uh, a i j uh, a i j uh, times y i times x j, right? So we are using the dual inequality constraints right here. And now what we can do, we can exchange uh, the order of summation. So we will get that this is equal to the sum i equals 1 to m and then we will have sum j equals 1 to m and then we have a i j uh, x so we also switch the order of uh, x and y so it will be x j Right, that's the only thing that depends on J and then times here YI, right? Now we can use the inequalities for the primal, right? We know that this sum is smaller or equal than BJ. Uh, Alex? Yes. It should be BI uh, up, there, up, up, up there on your inequality. In, oh, thank you very much. Uh, B I indeed. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, by the way, just as in three one two one, I give uh, extra credit for everyone who points out typo in my lecture notes. Uh, so, uh, if you read them, as I hope you do. Um, you can accumulate nice uh, extra credit uh, for your final mark for any type of any kind, right? Um, so now this uh, we use the primal inequality inequalities, and we know that this will be smaller or equal than sum uh, i equals. 1 to m, and this is smaller or equal than bi. So it would be bi <coughs> times yi. But this is precisely the dual objective z star of y. So what did we prove? We proved that for as long as x and y are such that they satisfy both the constraints of the primal for x's and y's satisfy the constraints for the dual, which means that both x is what we call a feasible solution to the primal problem. Physical solution is any evaluation of the variables that makes the constraints, all constraints, true regardless of how big is the value of the objective. Yes? What's the primal and the dual problem? 
Sorry? What's the primal and the dual problem? Okay, so the primal problem is just uh, the original uh, problem that asks you to maximize this linear combination subject to these constraints. Uh, and then you remember we went through this calculation. Uh, we wanted to see how big this can be by multiplying both sides here by new variables y uh, uh, i and uh, making sure that when we sum this up, we get the coefficients that are uh, of uh, that are smaller uh, that are sorry uh, yes smaller or equal than the coefficients here right uh, bigger or equal sorry than the coefficients here and that precisely reduces to the dual problem so you can read it in the lecture notes this is this uh, calculation that we went through last time huh? right uh, so any feasible solution from the primal makes the primal objective smaller or equal than any feasible solution to the dual objective. Now, this is precisely the situation like in max flow when we showed that the capacity, sorry, that the, any flow in a network flow must be smaller or equal than the capacity of any cut. Right? Now, uh, you remember the Ford Fulkerson algorithm that was, you know, uh, this addition of augmenting paths that increase the flow through the network, that you can pick essentially arbitrary paths, and we claim that the final total quantity of final flow is independent on how you added these augmenting paths. Well, just in the same way, yeah. uh, you remember last time we saw how um, uh, how simplex algorithm operates uh, by introducing the slack variables and uh, exchanging their roles uh, with the, uh, um, the initial set of the uh, variables. One can ask until all the coefficients become negative in the objective, one can ask uh, because you can choose uh, in what order you increase the values of the variables, uh, why do you always, oops, sorry, why do you always get uh, um, the same uh, maximal value for the objective? And the reason for that is just is the same kind of reason as in max flow for Falkerson algorithm. The maximum of this will be achieved precisely when this reaches minimum. Just like we had that max flow will be achieved precisely when you reach the capacity of mean cut. So you see all the values for z of x Right, so these are the values of z of x, and here you have the values for z star of y. And we know that any value of z of x is smaller or equal than any value of z star of y for as long as x and y are feasible uh, solutions to the two uh, problems. So because of that, the max if you find a value of z of x uh, that is also a value for z star of y, uh, this means that this value must be max of all of these guys and simultaneously mean of all of these guys. And so in fact, uh, uh, this justifies why the simplex algorithm uh, stops and in fact solvers for uh, linear programming actually simultaneously operate on both primal and dual and stop because of the presence of round-off errors. You don't exactly make them equal, but you make 
this difference between z value of z of x and value z star of y smaller than some thresholds of epsilon, usually 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6. Right? So um, the situation is precisely analogous to uh, what we had uh, uh, for max flow mean cap. But actually, this goes beyond just a mere analogy. So next thing that we want to do is we want to show that lo and behold, the max flow uh, mean cut can be reduced to uh, a primal and a dual linear programming uh, problem. So you can use, in fact, uh, um, linear programming to find uh, max flow and mean cut, uh, uh, even though some of the most recent max flow algorithms uh, usually perform uh, faster than if you do it by linear uh, programming. So let us, uh, let us now uh, look again and uh, max flow problem. You know, if you look at any textbook on uh, mathematical finance, like portfolio optimizations and things like that, you will be amazed uh, how often everything reduces just to a linear program. Uh, as for any kind of resource allocation, uh, or you know, if you are designing a pipeline of processors, uh, it often optimization there also also reduces to a linear program. So, um, in fact, I think I have a PhD thesis of one of our former students who uh, used linear programming precisely to design a uh, pipeline multiprocessor system for MPEG encoding. Um, so this is really extremely important technique. So you might want to at least read the notes and you can see much more in, uh, um, in the Corman Lasers on Rivers and Stain textbook. Okay, so let's remember again what max flow problem is. So you have a flow network with the directed uh, edges as pipes with given capacities, say capacity is kappa ij, uh, well this will be kappa source uh, j, j1, this will be kappa source uh, j2 and so forth, right? And then you have uh, here a sink, uh, t, Right? And uh, you want to maximize the throughput through your flow network, but uh, never exceeding the capacity of each pipe. Right? And the assumption is that uh, all flow comes from S and leaves from T. So uh, in every other vertex, incoming flow, some total of incoming flow through all of the edges, uh, right, uh, has to be equal to the outgoing flow through all of the outgoing um, edges. Uh, so how would we um, represent this as a linear problem, right? Well, let's start, uh, uh, first we know, let's the node by Fij is the amount of flow uh, from uh, true edge uh, 
um, E i j, right? So this is E i j. Um, so um, what do we know? Uh, we know the constraints, right? Uh, we know that f i j must be always smaller. So we take these unknown flows that uh, maximize the total throughput through the network. Uh, we use variables to denote them. And we now just uh, uh, find what they have to satisfy. So this will be used as variables. Right? So we know that each fij has to be smaller or equal than kappa ij. So kappa ij is the capacity of uh, eij. Right? We know that this is, uh, uh, we cannot exceed, the flow through any edge cannot exceed its capacity. What, we, what do we know? We know that there are no leaks in the network at any node. No leaks and no uh, new flow being generated. All the flow comes from S and leaves from T. So we know that the sum total uh, of all incoming edges, say I, let me use the same notation as in the notes. So, um, uh, I used I for the right and J for the outline. So, uh, we know that uh, sum of the all I's such that uh, uh, E such that the edge i j belongs to the or, uh, ordered graph i mean directed graph g of uh, all uh, flows uh, from i to vertex j uh, must be exactly equal uh, so this is i j in g and both i and j not equal, so uh, i not equal to s, right? i not equal to s, and j not equal to the thing d, right? So all, in the, uh, all edges uh, that um, are uh, internal, right? So we know that uh, uh, for every uh, uh, vertex j, sum of incoming flows must be equal to the sum of all outgoing flows. So k such that jk uh, belongs to g uh, of, uh, of uh, f uh, J, K, right? The, for all J that uh, is a vertex in, uh, in G. Okay. So this is, uh, these are the constraints. And what do we want to, what is our objective? Our objective is to maximize uh, Uh, either sum total of all outgoing flows from the sink, or which is of course equal sum total of all incoming flows, uh, sorry, outgoing flows from the source, or equal to all incoming flows to the sink. So let's take outgoing flows from S. So this will be sum uh, for all I, uh, belonging to G of uh, F from the source to I, right? 
So this is almost a linear program because the objective is a linear function of the variables f, right? And in the objective, only the outgoing flows figure from the source, right? But the only problem is that we have an equality here. Yes? Um, where you've said i not equal to s and j not equal to t, surely, like, if... So you want j not equal to s ah, or yes, t. Yes, 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 yes. You're right. So we want all the uh, all the uh, edges that uh, leave. So forty. So let's see. Uh, so i shouldn't be equal to s, right? Or uh, no, because j, j shouldn't be equal to s. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so j. j not equal to S and I not equal to T. That's right. No? Uh, well, I is incoming to J anyway, so it's never going to be equal to T. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, I guess... J, J is the, the vertex that you're counting the flow around. So right. you want, well, so you want you J, J not equal to T either. No, no, you, you do, ah, yes, 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 so you don't want uh, uh, j equals to t as well, but then uh, s also has no incoming flow, so we have to rule out that i is also not equal to s, so actually what I wrote was correct. But like, if, if, if j was one of the vertices adjacent to s, you want to count the flow from s to j as e coming to, to j. Oh, yeah, but, uh, uh, yes, so only j, let's see, only j shouldn't be equal to... s or t. s or t. Okay, that's, that's right. So the other is and it shouldn't be because J is existing across both sums. There's not a condition that's for that. That's right. Sum. So uh, the assumption is uh, that uh, J not equal to T, right? Or S. Or S. Well, this is a for theory for S, right? Because it's always the yeah. Okay. So. Um, so this is almost a linear program, except that this is an equality rather than an inequality, right? So, but any, any equality is reducible to two inequalities, right? Because A equals to B is uh, reducible to A bigger than B uh, and uh, A smaller than smaller or equal uh, and a bigger or equal than b and you can match the sign to make it all smaller by keeping a smaller or equal than b and minus a smaller or equal than minus b so using these two equivalent uh, so this is equivalent to a is equal to b you can get rid of this in a, this equality but there is a better way of getting this rid of this inequality that's a little bit trickier to verify that it's the same, but you can do it for your exercise. What you do, you make the flow circular. So you add another pipe uh, of capacity T to S equal infinity. Right? And you make the flow circular. Right? Why is this so? Because then it's easy to verify that you then need only one inequality suffices to replace the equality. So you will reduce this to the following equation. So our objective will be again uh, maximize 
sum uh, when i go belongs to g of f of s i and the inequalities are so subject so and then inequalities are again f i j smaller or equal to the capacity i j right plus uh, only one inequality let's see which one i took uh, inequality that says uh, sum of all um, sum of all uh, um, outgoing flow so i such that i j belongs to g uh, of f i j minus uh, sum over all k's such that j k belongs to g of f j k is smaller or equal than zero so essentially what we did we took only inequality in this direction and move this to the other side so that all the variables are on the left hand side and the, uh, the inequality in the opposite direction can be seen to follow from inequality in one direction because outgoing flows become eventually incoming flows so if everything that comes in is larger is uh, what it's uh, smaller no larger uh, let's see yes uh, is uh, smaller or equal than everything that uh, comes in then you are guaranteed that our inequality in the opposite uh, direction is also true because all outgoing flow eventually becomes uh, incoming flow so you can verify this uh, uh, easily and of course we have the assumptions that all fijs uh, 